more than anything else. It's the number one cause of disease. And if you're deficient in any of those, you will impair your immune system. It is great. It's like a vac vaccination, a natural vaccination where you make your body the way nature meant it to be. Eleven million people die every single year from eating bad food and not eating enough good food. And that's I think that's incredible. an underestimate. And it's the number one killer on the planet. More than smoking, more than lack of exercise, more than accidents, guns, violence, more than anything else. It's the number one cause of disease. Yeah. I mean, think about it. If Ebola or Zika was killing 11 million people a year, don't you think there'd be a massive global collective effort to change that. Scientists, policymakers, businesses, everybody would be on board to solve these terrible yeah. epidemics. But we have it right in front of us and nobody's dealing with it. So, 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 so why is that, Mark? Because the stats you've just mentioned are mind-blowing. You know, I, I hope by now most listeners to this podcast are aware that actually food is not important just for our physical health, but our minds, our emotional health. It's so many yeah. different components of our health. But why are we not giving it the attention societally that we are, you know, on an individual level? Because you have spent your career writing, you know, bestseller after bestseller, <laughs> trying to empower people to make better food choices, more helpful food choices for mm. them. You've spent your career seeing patients one on one and helping them on an individual level change their food choices and see a consequent improvement yes, in their health. That's true. So you've seen that, but are you? Or have you found, like I have found, that sometimes you give the best advice that you possibly can to the patient in front of you, yet they then go That's out so into hard. a food landscape yeah. where they simply cannot, or yeah. it is too challenging to make those choices that you and I would like them to make? It's true. I mean, we live in a food system where it's super easy to make the wrong choice and super hard to make the right choice. You know, we're in America, 23 million Americans live in a food desert where they can't find a vegetable. You know, I met a woman from Cleveland who lived in the project. She said her mother wanted to feed her healthy food. She had to literally take four buses on a two hour round trip to just buy some vegetables for her family. That's the world we live in. We live in a world where 80% uh, of the food in grocery stores is processed and contains sugar, where the food we're eating is all commodities. You know, 60% of the food we eat is basically derived from a number of few products, wheat, corn, and soy, which is basically flour, sugar, and refined oils that are turned into all varieties of processed food. Basically, if you cover the front of the package, you couldn't tell what's in the box, if it's a pizza or a corn dog, because yeah. it's all the same nonsense. And, and so we, we have a very tough time for people to change. And that's why I realized it's not people's fault when, when they're advertised food that is addictive, when the food's designed to be biologically hijacking their brain chemistry and their metabolism, when we know the science is so clear on this and yet we do nothing about it. You know, in America, we have one in two people with a chronic disease and that's increasing dramatically. We have, you know, children, 40% are overweight, 70% of Americans are overweight and increasingly across the globe, we're seeing the same thing as the food industry is exporting its toxic products across the globe. We're seeing, um, people suffering mental illness. We're seeing people driven, which is driven in part by the food we're eating. And, and we're still trying to solve the problem in the doctor's office. Uh, yeah. And the costs are staggering. I mean, just in America alone over the next 35 years, the cost of chronic illness, both direct and indirect costs is $95 trillion. I, I don't even know what- Let me just put that in perspective. That's $3.1 trillion a year. And the entire federal tax revenue, the amount that the government collects from the citizens is 3.8 million. So it's almost the entire federal budget that's needed yeah. to pay for chronic I mean, I'm disease. glad you put that in context because these figures, they're so big, they're so mm. staggering that for many of us, we don't even know what that means. Yeah. What does one trillion, two trillion, well, three trillion, what does you, that mean? Let me tell you, a trillion, if you take $95 <laughs> trillion and you stack them in dollar bills up into the sky, it would reach 6.4 billion miles. <laughs> now, the, the new, new Horizon spaceship has been traveling for 13 years to get past Pluto at 36,000 miles an hour, and it's only gone 4 billion miles. 
Oh. <laughs> so can you imagine how much money that is? It's basically the entire economy of the entire world. And, and I guess that is what you were saying at the start, that food is, yes, it's about health, but you're making the case that it's so much more than that. It's about politics, it's about the economy, it's about the environment, it's about climate change. All of these things yes. come from food, which is very powerful. Yeah, if we figured out how to fix this money thing, we'd have money for free education for everybody on the planet, for free healthcare, for social services for the needy among us. We'd be able to create a very vibrant, economy and society rather than being burdened by this it, food caused epidemic of chronic disease it, it's kind of as, as if on one level we've got this the wrong way around we're accepting the food system the way it is and saying okay that's the food system we need to pour more money into this system because it's not working you know in the uk the national health service we need to pour more money into the national health service but actually no it looks so you know, we're both interested in getting to the root cause of our patients' problems, but actually the root cause of many of society's problems, from what you're saying- also food. Is food. <laughs> yeah, let's go into it. So we've got the chronic disease epidemic, we've got the economic burden. Let's talk about some of the social justice issues around this. Yeah, well I, well, I think what, what will tie in really nicely there is, is something you said, which is, I realize that for many of my patients, it's not their fault. Now, mm -hmm. I think that was, really poignant because when people talk about healthy food choices, a lot of people on social media, a lot of people in the media will still think it is the person's fault. They know what they should be doing. They're simply not following the advice. They need more willpower. They need to get a grip of their life. It's not good enough. But I guess what you're saying is it's not their fault. No. Why do so many people think it is their fault? And why do you think it's not their fault? Oh, well, that's a great question. So the reason people think it's their fault is because we've been told by doctors, nutritionists, our governments, and of course the food industry, that all calories are the same. That calories in, calories out, exercise more, eat less, you lose weight. And if you don't do it, it's your fault that all calories are the same, it's just about moderation, and that you know, 20 ounce soda with 250 calories is exactly the same as eight and a half cups of broccoli with 250 calories. That, I mean, even a five-year-old can get that's ridiculous, but that's exactly the message out there. And when all calories are the same, then you know, there's a sense of, well, just you know, control yourself, right? Control yourself, it's your fault. But the truth is, we know from the science that not all calories are the same, and ultra-processed Food calories affect the body, the brain, and metabolism very differently. So what are ultra-processed foods for people who are listening to this? It's pretty much everything in the supermarket in the middle aisles. It's packaged food. Uh, it's, it's refined foods. It's white flour. It's white sugar. It's high fructose corn. It's trans fats. All the food additives and chemicals that are in food when you buy a package of processed food. It's basically what's made by the food industry. It's Anything, the opposite of Whole Foods, right? Yes. I mean, you, I, I make it really simple. When I teach in churches, I say, you know, it's really simple to know what to eat. Leave the food that man made, eat the food that God made. Did God make a Twinkie? No. Did God make an avocado? Yeah. Does it have an ingredient list? It's probably not good to eat. Now, of course, there are some foods that are simple ingredient lists. So it's sardines, olive oil and salt, or tomatoes, water and salt, or, you know, there's stuff that you can buy that's yeah. canned or packaged that is real food. But most of them are not. And what's true, and this is this is this is validated with over in, 300 interviews with food industry insiders, whistleblowers, food scientists. It was done by Michael Moss. These foods are designed to be biologically addictive. They have craving and experts that work in taste institutes to create the bliss point of food, the quote bliss point of food, designed to create what they call heavy users. These are their internal terms that they use within the food industry. They know actually how to create that perfect mouthfeel, that perfect brain hook where your brain is literally addicted. So it's like if I said to a patient, listen, I want you to hold your breath underwater for 10 minutes. I'm going to give you $5 million. Darn right, they're going to want to do that, but they won't be able to do that, right? And it's the same thing when we're eating these foods. They alter our brain chemistry and our hormones in a way that affects our ability to control our behavior. And if you, shit, if you shut that off, it changes everything. So I'll just tell you a quick story about this woman, Janice, who came to our center, um, the Center for Functional Medicine at Cleveland, and joined one of our groups. And she was 66. She had type 2 diabetes. She'd been on insulin for 10 years. She had a body mass index of 43, which is 
very overweight. 25 or less is normal. 30 is obese. She was 43. She had high blood pressure, heart failure. Kidneys were starting to fail. Her liver was starting to fail. And she was on a boatload of medications, blood thinners, blood pressure medications, cholesterol meds, diuretics, you name it, she was on it. And her whole life, I mean, she was a very educated woman, but her whole life, she had never learned about food. She grew up in a home that all they ate was packaged and processed food. She grew up in a home where they didn't cook. And she was just focused on her career and her life and was doing really great things, but was really on her way out. Uh, and we just literally put her on a whole foods, anti-inflammatory detoxifying diet, basically similar to the 10 day detox diet, the book that I wrote, which is very low in starch and sugar. Within three days, she was off her insulin. In three months, she was off all her medications. Her blood sugar was normal. Her A1C went from 11 to five and a half, which as a doctor, you know, is extremely dramatic. And I mean, that, that, to put in context for people listening, that's from um, being a very, very poorly controlled type 2 diabetic to not actually going into the pre-diabetic range, actually into the normal, normal range. range. Yeah. And then her heart failure, which by the way, heart failure never reverses in conventional medicine. You can manage it with medications. Her ejection fraction was 35%. If it's under 30, you're headed towards a heart transplant. And it went up to 50 after her, her three months. And her kidney failure, she was on her way to dialysis, reversed, just using the power of food and putting her in a group setting where she was given support and education and knowledge. Wow. I mean, that, that is so inspiring for and people. And she lost, she lost over the course of a year, 116 pounds, and now has her life back. And yeah. is off all medication and saved about $20,000 in co-pays for her medication. And I don't know what her insurance company was paying. Yeah. I mean... Mark, you have got countless stories like that because you have been talking about using food as medicine for years now. You know, yeah. I remember before I even got into this uh, way of thinking, you know, I was reading blogs that you'd been writing and and thinking, wow, this is incredible. I wonder if that will work if I try that. Yeah. And, <laughs> no, does, but, but, and you does. can see how impassioned yeah. you are yeah. talking about this. But, you know, you mentioned the addictive qualities of foods. And I think... It reminds me of a conversation I had recently on the podcast with Professor Felice Jacker. Uh, you probably, you may not know her, but you'll be familiar with her work. She was in charge of the first randomized control trial, the SMILES trial that was done in Australia to look at um, whether diet can, uh, you know, can improve depression. Mood, depression. Yeah, yeah and, and she study, showed yeah. the first, exactly 67 patients. So she, she showed that the group who changed their diet to a modified Mediterranean yes. diet after 12 weeks had above a 30% remission rate compared to only 8% in the control group, which was yeah. social support. Yeah. And when I spoke to her on my podcast, I also mentioned to her that my cousin, uh, who's in his late 20s, he's now working, he drives to work every day in his car. And he says when he's driving home after a day, after a busy day's work, there is one roundabout in particular <laughs> where there is a KFC. Yes. And he says, I can smell the food every time I go through that roundabout and I can't always resist. I will often succumb to that smell. He so put his windows up and the recirculation button on his car. So he doesn't yeah, get but, but what's interesting is that you mentioned the taste of these foods yeah. is formulated in such a way that they, they almost have that sort of addictive quality to them. Um, Not almost, actually measurable on brain scans looking at the part of the brain that's affected just like heroin or cocaine it's not it's not an emotional addiction it's a biological addiction wow do you know much about the smell of these foods whether it can do similar things i bet it can i mean i i've been succumbing at sometimes like yeah. once at a very stressful trip and i was coming back from somewhere and it was i was my flame was delayed and i was gonna get it to in the morning and i'd see patients the next day and I felt sorry for myself. And there was a Cinnabon stand and they blow the, like, I think they have a fan where they blow the, the, yeah. the, 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 and the smell towards you. And I, I just went and had a Cinnabon. But yeah, it was terrible. I felt horrible after. Yeah, but, but you, you're, you're just showing that we're all human. We can know as much as we want about the right food choices. Yeah. You clearly know about the right food choices, but even you are susceptible when life gets tough, when you're stressed, when you're tired, if the food environment around you is blowing out that smell, is um, you know tempting you with their offerings, ultimately yeah. it's going to be very hard to make yeah. those good choices. And that's why right. we have to change the food system. And that's why this book, Food Fix, is for me such an important part of how I think about the world now. And I think about 
yes, you know, it's it's about obesity and diabetes and chronic disease, but also it's about mental health, as you said. And even in our kids, you know, we see our kids not functioning well. One in 10 kids have attention deficit. 40% of our kids in America are overweight in school. We have uh, increasing amounts of performance issues. We have what we call an achievement gap. You know, we're 31st in the world in, in education, math and, and reading and so forth. We're worse than Vietnam. And, and the reason is because it's affecting our kids' brains and their cognitive function. This is well documented. These kids are nutritionally deficient. And the kids who grew up in poor environments or don't have adequate high quality nutrition, their brains are 10% smaller. Their IQ points, seven per, points lower. They're, we've literally lost millions of IQ points in our children. You mentioned kids who are growing up in poor environments, so these deprived communities. And we know full well what the research says about people living in in areas of lower socioeconomic status. Is the way the food industry is set up, does it unfairly penalize those with the least in society? So when we look at the social injustice around food, it's massive. You know, when you look at how the food industry targets poor and minorities, it's disproportionate. So they're targeting them with more ads and more marketing, and they're providing their communities with more of these foods, such as soda and processed food. And it has a big impact on them. African Americans are 80% more likely to get diabetes. They're, you know, four times more likely to get fit kidney failure. They're three and a half more times more likely to get amputations. And, and these communities are being targeted by the food industry in direct ways. And, and then there's accessibility to poor environments where there's no grocery stores, where there's, you know, convenience stores and and no produce stores. Yeah, so so for seven years, Mark, I worked in a place called Oldham in North Manchester in the UK. And it was in right at the center of Oldham and, and the practice was in quite a deprived area, what, what most people would consider a deprived area. Most of my patients were, uh, you know, were, were certainly on very low incomes. Many were working two jobs. But what was interesting is these guys really cared about themselves and their families. They were trying to make the best decisions. And I think it's really important to highlight this because I think a lot of blame gets put on people no, who, totally trying. Who, who are struggling with their health and, and are making certain food choices. But I saw firsthand how, like, for, ex for example, I would usually bring my lunch into work with me. On the rare occasion where I forgot to bring it, sometimes I think, okay, I'm just going to go and walk and, and buy something. It certainly is not like <laughs> Santa Monica where we, we're <clears throat> recording this podcast, yeah. which is probably the wellness capital in the world where it's super easy to buy something healthy, yes. right? I would walk for about a mile in diameter around that practice and I Couldn't struggled find to find anything because there, were, there was at least seven or eight fried chicken and kebab shops with big signs on there saying something like, you know, one pound 99, eat as much as you can. You know, that's what, two pounds, that's what, maybe about three dollars. You it's very hard to compete with that. And I thought I thought I can give them the best advice that I possibly can, but they're moving into an environment where it's simply too difficult day in, day out to make those healthy choices. Yeah. In addition, they they I found were very trusting of the government and the supermarkets. Yeah. So when I explained to them about certain breakfast cereals that they were having in the morning. It was all sugar. Yeah, they were shocked. Yeah. And they said, well, Dr. Shashi, but yeah, but why are they being sold in the supermarkets? There's a picture of, you know, a heart. It says heart's healthy on it. Because <laughs> there's no fat. <laughs> no, no, but what's interesting for me, Mark, is that these guys were trying their best. Yeah. They literally were shocked when I was telling this information. Mm. So when we think that everyone knows this stuff no, now, no. they don't. No, no, and it true. is these deprived areas which are getting hit the hardest. Absolutely. I remember when I was... Uh, and then helping with this movie, Fed Up, which was released a few years ago yeah, about the effect of I the food it. industry and sugar on the, the health of our nation. There was a family that I worked with and they lived in one of the worst food deserts in America. They were very overweight. The father was 42, already had kidney failure on dialysis for, from diabetes at 42. The mother was severely overweight. The son was severely overweight at 16, had almost diabetes and struggled and they lived in a trailer on food stamps and disability they were you know trying to lose weight because the father couldn't get a new kidney until he lost 40 pounds but they didn't know what to do and they were eating all this stuff that they thought was healthy like cool whip because it had zero trans fats which is basically all trans fats and sugar it just basically threw a loophole in the government that allowed them to actually say zero trans fat they had processed salad dressings they 
use iceberg lettuce. They didn't never knew how to cook. They didn't have any utensils. They didn't have knives, cutting knives. They didn't have cutting boards. Well, uh, so I said, well, rather than me giving you a lecture on, you know, how to eat healthy, let's just go into your kitchen. Let's get some groceries and make simple food. We made turkey chili. We made a salad from like real lettuce and real vegetables and olive oil and vinegar dressing. We roasted some sweet potatoes with some herbs. We stir fried some asparagus. They didn't know how to do any of that. They didn't know how to roast. They didn't know how to saute. They didn't know how to nothing. Uh, and they, what vegetables they had were canned green beans and iceberg lettuce. And that was pretty much it. And everything else was from a box or a package. And they really didn't know. And I said, here's what it's going on. And I took everything out of their cupboard. I showed them everything. I covered up the like, front of the boxes and said, what is this? And they couldn't tell by looking at the ingredient list. And I said, it's all the same stuff, just in different size, shapes, and colors. Yeah. And, and they were so eager. And they, I said, let's cook a meal together. So we sat together. We cooked. We talked. We had fun. They loved the food. It was delicious. And I said, look, I, you guys can do this. Here's a cookbook. Here's a guide on eating. Eat well for less. You know, good food on a tight budget. And I didn't know what was going to happen. In the first week, she texted me back. We lost 18 pounds as a family. Within a year, the mother lost about 100 pounds. The son lost 50. Gained it back by working at a fast food restaurant, which uh, is only place to work down there. But eventually, he got his act together. He lost 138 pounds. He asked me for a letter of recommendation for medical school. And now he's in medical school. Wow. You know, <laughs> which is just staggering and amazing. And we have, you know, the ability to, to actually do this if people understand what's going on. But most people don't understand that they're being taken advantage of, that they're being targeted. The system is set up for them to fail. And and it's not an accident. You know, we have, I, I was sort of alluding to the reason we have these policies is because the food industry controls the government. Uh, they spend half a billion dollars just on our farm bill in the U.S., which is controls our food and ag policy. There's 100% of the Senate and House Ag Committee members are on the take from big food and big ag in terms of campaign donations. Um, who do you think they're going to support? Corporate interests or citizens? And it's really unfortunate. The the uh, The policies we have are so destructive. I'll just go through them. One, you know, we... We support the growing of commodity foods, corn, soy, and wheat, which gets turned into processed foods. So we make it cheap to have processed food and it's high fructose corn syrup. I mean, the vice chairman of Pepsi said, when I asked him why do you use high fructose corn syrup, he said, because the government makes it too cheap for us not to use it. Wow. <laughs> and I said, you know, we, we have policies that allow unlimited marketing of junk food to our children and the rest of us where it's proven to cause harm. We'll, uh, uh, the FDA makes food labels, the Federal Drug, Food and Drug Administration, that are so confusing that the average person can't understand them and doesn't uh, prohibit the use of toxic chemicals that are used in our food supply, which are mostly banned in Europe. Things like BHT and other things. We have policies that support food stamps. In other words, not only are we gr helping grow the food that's the bad food, but then we provide it to our poor with $75 billion a year in food stamps, 7 billion of which is soda and Coca-Cola's major source of American revenue, 20% of it comes from food stamps. Without, that is so they're the biggest welfare blowing. queen. <laughs> could you, could, for, for, for a lot of my UK listeners, could you explain what food stamps are? Yeah, food stamps, basically food assistance. If you're poor and there are 46 million Americans who need food support because they're basically you know, it's like a card, credit card that you can go buy food with. Uh, and they can't afford to buy food, so the government gives them money to do it. But it's all processed food. And one in four children in this country depend on food stamps. So so it seems, seems maddening this, because on one hand, you've got potentially the government doing a good thing, which is, okay, you can't afford food. We're going to help you. Yeah. But with the other hand, they're supporting, if I understand this right, they're uh, supporting completely. the wrong food choices really? or the unhelpful food choices. So... They could keep the food stamp system, but encourage whole foods instead right. of processed foods. And right. then suddenly you're helping these communities out and supporting their health. Absolutely. And it's been shown you could save billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of deaths by incentivizing good food and, and de-incentivizing bad food. Both you and I have spoken to Dan Buetner on our podcasts, um, the chap who has studied extensively these so-called blue zones around the world, these areas of um, high longevity, these longevity hotspots. And what's what's striking about that is that a lot of people are, you know, you know, debating what are the various components of that. But one thing that seems to be really consistent is that the environment is set up in such a way that it makes the healthy choice the easy choice. Yeah. Right. And yeah. 
Right. You mentioned a statistic, something like if you if you serve healthy food in a prison, yeah. it, what, it, what, it was 50 something percent? Well, it was, they basically were looking at, you know, you talked about the SMILE study about yeah. the effect of food on depression. And we know mental illness is really driven by a lot of nutritional deficiencies. In, in violence and behavior change, we don't really think about it that way. But in prisons, they've done randomized trials where they put half the group on a healthy diet, half the group on the same prison diet, who were violent criminals, violent in prison, and they reduced violent crime by 56%. And if they added a multivitamin, they reduced it by 80%. And I remember once coming home from, I mean, coming into my office at work and there was a letter, a handwritten letter that was from a prisoner in prison who said, Dr. Hyman, I read your book in prison. I changed my diet and I don't know how we did it in prison. He said, I realized my whole life as a violent criminal was because of what I was eating. I feel like a completely different person. So that is powerful, isn't it? That is so incredibly powerful to see the power of foods yeah there is something going on in the uk at the moment actually which i'm, I'm just going to bring up here and a lot of people are getting quite annoyed and, and very frustrated with the term food as medicine or food as medicine it's really, really interesting yeah and i, I know a, they have a quarrel with hippocrates huh <laughs> yeah i know my thoughts on it and i think they're probably very similar to yours but Maybe it's just be a nice little offshoot here to to touch on, you know, these stories you're mentioning, the Smiles trial, this prisoner who wrote to you, uh, all the countless case studies you've got and I've got, um, you know, is food medicine? Absolutely. I mean, there is no doubt about it. I'm William Lee just wrote a book called Eat to Beat Disease, who's a Harvard uh, uh, physician. Yeah, and I'm not ready. I've seen it everywhere. I've not actually read that it's book. It's really yet. brilliant. But he 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 showed a slide and, and these very sophisticated analyses testing food components compared to drug components. So a blood pressure drug, a cholesterol drug, you know, heart failure drug, whatever the drug is, and looked at various food components and how it compared in terms of the effectiveness using very sophisticated models for testing these in, in biology. And they found that almost every single time food beat out the drug in terms of effectiveness. Wow. And what food is, is far more than calories, as I was talking about, not all calories are the same. That's the biggest myth that's perpetuating everything. Because in, in, a, in the fast food world, if all the calories are the same, it doesn't matter if it's KFC or soda or French fries, as long as you balance your calories, doesn't matter what you eat. That's not true because food is information. So we know that food influences the body in multiple ways. One, it changes gene expression. You literally can turn on or off genes by what you eat. If you eat broccoli, you can turn on genes that help you detoxify and produce glutathione, right? If you eat green tea, you drink green tea, you increase the level of catechins, which have the ability to detoxify heavy metals and activate various enzymes. If you, if you eat the right foods, you can balance your hormones. If you eat the wrong foods, you eat too much insulin, your testosterone goes down if you eat too much yeah. sugar. If you eat the right fats, it's the opposite. If you look at what it does to your brain chemistry, you can either hijack your brain chemistry or it can make you calm and peaceful in your mood. It can change your microbiome. You literally have trillions of bacteria in your gut that control almost every function of your body. And when you eat the wrong foods, you grow the bad ones that make you sick. And when you eat the right foods, you grow the good ones that make you healthy. So literally with every bite in real time, you're changing your biochemistry, your physiology, your genetics every single minute of the day. Yeah. Yep. You're absolutely right. I mean, it is that powerful. I, yeah, I mean, this is not my opinion, by the way. This is just hard science. Yeah. And, and I would extend that out. It, of course, we're talking about food, but but even sleep. There's a there's really good studies showing that a single night's sleep deprivation changes the expression, I think, of over 700 genes. Yeah. You know, that if you haven't slept well, uh, you you're, the genes that actually predispose to inflammation, the pro-inflammatory genes get turned on and the anti-inflammatory ones start getting switched off. Yep. So our lifestyle literally is medicine. It's not just prevention of uh, health problems. It can often be used as the treatment as well. And that's Absolutely. something that I think is still not yeah. recognized enough. It's still, that's it always right. comes down to prevention. And of yeah. course, prevention is better than cure. Sure. But you can use lifestyle a lot of the time Absolutely. as treatment well, as well. As like the story with Janice. I mean, yeah. we weren't preventing her heart failure, preventing her diabetes, no. preventing her high blood pressure. We were treating it with food and with lifestyle. So yes, food is medicine, exercise is medicine, sleep is medicine, stress reduction is medicine, you know, connection and love is medicine. Yeah. These are all medicines. And, then, and, and they uh, work well. 
And better most, than drugs. And most importantly, this is the medicine we need primarily for the health problems of the 21st century. Yeah. That's the key. Maybe 30, 40 years ago, you know, what? maybe we didn't need these things as medicine in the same way. Maybe our conventional opinion of medicine, like a drug that we prescribe, you know, if you've got an acute problem and you come in with that, you know, I can understand where that rationale has come from. But the health landscape of the US, of the UK, has changed dramatically. So we now need these lifestyle tools as our medicine. By the way, twice as many people die from chronic lifestyle diseases as infectious diseases, not just here, but globally. Yeah. So, so even so in that, Africa, they're suffering the double burden of malnutrition and obesity. Yeah. I mean, exactly. It's slightly ironic in many ways. And it's, I think, not calling food medicine, I think is doing our patients a disservice because then it's not put on the same level or a higher level than let's say the pharmaceutical drug that we might have to offer. And I think that's the danger when we don't talk about it in these terms. I mean, listen, what happened to Jess? There's no drug on the planet that can do that. There's no drug on the planet that can reverse your need for insulin in three days or can no. reverse your heart failure or can reverse your kidney failure. They just don't exist. Yeah. And food can do it. And I've seen yeah. it over and over again. I may sound like a crazy man, but the truth is this is actually what the science shows. It's actually what people who are using food in this way see all the time. Well, you, you know, you don't sound crazy. You know what you sound like? You sound like someone- <laughs> A little crazy. <laughs> who has been practicing medicine for many years. How many years now? 32. 32 years of seeing tens of thousands of patients. You have seen firsthand the impact. And literally, you just sound someone to me who's just very passionate. You've seen it. You've seen the structural problems and you wanna take on something that not many people are taking on. You're not writing another book. Um, you've written many great books, but this feels very different to me. It this is. is taking on the political structure, the economic structure. You're looking at food in a, in a different way. And I think that's very, very important. And I, and I wanna thank you for that, because I think it's very important that this sort of message gets out there. Coming back to systemic change, and we talked about making the food environment easier, and we are talking about prisons. I want to talk about schools. So I'm a father, as you are. I've got two young children. They're both at primary school at the moment. And what's interesting for me is that while my kids are a bit younger, you know, they're currently nine and six, I was okay at sort of, I won't say controlling, but I could, I could sort of control yeah, you in make many ways. You lunch, you feed them breakfast, you feed them what dinner. they're eating. Yeah. And as my children are getting older, particularly my son now who's nine, and he's been exposed to more and more things, it's getting harder and harder. So this may be controversial to some, but I'm gonna share my view on this. So on the final day of school last year, before the summer break, a lot of the teachers brought in Haribo's for the kids. What's that? Uh, so Haribo's are a very popular food make, certainly in the UK, of sweets, uh, oh, candy, basically. Okay. I'm sh I don't know if they're here, or you must have an equivalent here. Yeah, probably. But these are bags of sweets that are very, very common. Now, the reality is my kids don't eat that stuff because I've never given it to them. Um, now, you know, a lot of people will probably say, well, I've, you know, that's too brutal. You need to expose them to this sort of stuff. And, you know, I, like all parents, I'm trying to do the best that I can. Mm -hmm. This is what I consider to be the best decision. Maybe time will tell that I was wrong, but I'm certainly trying to do the best that you I can. You have given them more junk food? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's about trying to teach them a balance. And I just think the norm in society is so skewed away from health at the moment that fitting in with what is quite a sick society, I don't think necessarily is biologically normal. I don't think it's the, the right thing. And so I'm trying to protect my kids as much as possible. Now, Jamie Oliver has been involved with trying to change various things in the UK. I helped him with his last campaign about junk food advertising. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that is different in Europe compared to America. Yeah. We do have some regulation around that. Maybe it's not perfect, but mm -hmm. there is something still there. Mm -hmm. Now, at the last meeting, I was down at, in Jamie's office where a lot of opinion makers were there. We were, we were discussing this. There was this whole idea of schools being a safe zone yeah. came up. Yeah. And for me, I really like that. Something I've been talking about for years that, that essentially a school or a hospital or even a prison, right? But, but let's get back to schools, particularly schools. I think schools should be the model educationally, but also health-wise. I genuinely don't see why there is a case in 2019 and 2020 why 
when we're facing this chronic disease epidemic, when in the UK, one in three kids leave primary school to go to secondary school at the age of 10 or 11 are either overweight or obese. I find it very hard to justify the case now where any school should be serving these sort of, uh, <laughs> these sweets, sugar sweetened beverages, packets of sweets, because what that also does is it normalizes the food. Yeah. It, it allows us to start associating reward and doing well with sweet food. And you know, I had difficult conversations with my son. And my son said to me, Daddy, why is everyone having a Haribo at school? I mean, you've been telling me this isn't very good for my health, but why is, why is everyone giving it out? And so what does that do? This is another problem which is not getting spoken about enough, Mark, is that if you are a parent who is trying to do the right thing with your very children, tough. You are then you're then making your children social outcasts because they're not engaging in a society that is actually engaging in a lot of unhealthy behaviors. I'm confused. Help me out, Mark. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know what it's like in the UK, but in the United States, schools have been infiltrated by the food industry. Eighty percent of schools have contract with soda companies. Fifty percent of schools sell brand name fast food at lunch. McDonald's, Burger King, Domino's Pizza. In schools. In schools. I mean, I, I don't know it's, if I'm in the UK. If anyone knows about taco. that, please tweet me and Mark and let us know or yeah. let us know on Instagram because I'll be super interested I, I to went know. to a school. But I'm not aware of that. I UK. went to an underserved school in Cleveland and um, it was a poor African-American Hispanic school. The 43% of kids are absent. 1%, 1%. By the time they graduate, are qualified to go to college. I walked down the hall. There was a young girl, very overweight. One hand, she had a 32 ounce, like a liter slushy, and another 32 ounce or a liter soda in the other hand. And you know, these schools have fast, um, you know, food in them, and they have deep fryers and microwaves in the kitchen. I walked through the kitchen. There was not a stove. <laughs> you couldn't cook food. It all came out of boxes, packages, processed food, so burgers, fries. Clearly, this is a problem. It's a problem it's a for their problem. health. But but there's advertising in school. So the in the bathroom stalls, there's like Coca Cola ads. <laughs> I mean, it's everywhere in the school. Where, where I see the problem, Mark, is that yes, that's bad for their health. But I think the problem is deeper than that because what that does is that it almost ingrains the kids. Of course. It's, in a it's, certain way of thinking. Hook certain, them while they're young. Yeah, hook them while they're young. That's Absolutely. The that's the science of what they're doing and they're deliberate and intentional about it. And there are schools that are fighting back. There's, for example, a friend of mine who's created a, a program with the schools to rehab the kitchens to get local chefs to create great recipes that are within the school lunch budget and the school lunch guidelines and has revolutionized the Boston City School District and the mayor is now involved and they literally have transformed schools and getting these kids eating real whole healthy food that they love. What about the parents who say that actually our kids should be allowed to be sweet treats at school? It's too draconian not allowing them to have this at school. What, what is your view there? Maybe they should just give them a few lines of cocaine in school along with their lunch or a little heroin booth there where they can get a shot of heroin. <laughs> I mean, listen, the science is so clear that these foods are harmful, they're deadly, they're addictive. Why would you give them to your kids? Yes, you can have a sweet treat. Yes, you can have sugar, of course, but make it from real food, yeah. not ultra processed food that's going to hijack your brain and your metabolism. You say that everyone sh would benefit from taking a cold shower every day. Why is the cold so powerful? The cold, uh, without a doubt, very directly, very effectively, very strongly, uh, is able to tackle our, uh, the biggest health problem in the world, which is the cardiovascular related diseases. And uh, we have a, 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 this, the, the organ, uh, which is called uh, our skin, and we never expose it to natural elements. And it is built to be able to, st to, be, uh, 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 to be stimulated. The electroreceptors, thermal receptors, they are all in the surface of our skin that directly goes when we take a cold shower, like an electrical jolt through our spine to our uh, the deepest part of our brain, the brain stem. It's being alive. Oh, oh yeah, the shocking experience that you are surviving. 
That is a great way to not only give a jolt to, uh, say, an electroshock uh, to your brain. For the people who are into depression, this is great. You just take the cold shower and your uh, depression is going to be depressed. So that, that is one. The other thing is, uh, we got, uh, all of us, we have 100,000 kilometers, like uh, 70,000 miles of vascular little channels, capillaries, arteries, and veins. Hundred more, like 100,000 kilometers. That is a lot. That is like two and a half times the world is in each and every one of us. They contain millions of little muscles and they help the blood flow going through, but not if it is in a condition after we have lived, been living with clothes all the time, which is a destimulative behavior and which makes the muscle tone go low. And who has got to compensate for that? That is our heart. Our heart is pumping more than it should. It's pumping more because it tries to get the blood flow full of oxygen, the nutrients and the vitamins to the cells. And it is not able to do that. You weaken yourself because you are in stress. And that stress uh, that uh, uh, creates oxidative uh, stress uh, uh, through uh, the continuous presence of cortisol. And that is when the heart rate goes up, that is normally done when there is danger to pump the glucose through the body. And the adrenaline, that is when there is danger. Now it is danger because we have a weak condition within our vascular system. Maybe not when you are young still, but when you are 30, 35, 40, it begins really to wear out. A cold shower stimulates all the vascular uh, muscle tone, and uh, thus the blood flow will go better to the cells. Heart rate goes down with 20 to 30 beats a minute, 24 hours a day, and the energy is being fat the energy processes, the metabolic uh, uh, mitochondrial processes are being fed with all the oxygen, nutrients, vitamins, all what is needed, you get plenty of energy. So when you take a cold shower a day, it does not only keep the doctor away, as a saying, also the doctor is doing it. And uh, it, because it is great, it's like a va vaccination, a natural vaccination where you make your body the way nature meant it to be, with a great blood flow, which doesn't know inhibition, fears, blockages, sclerosis, or anything like that, because it's flowing. There is no cortisol, no oxidative stress going on. This is the way nature meant it to be. Everybody in the world should take the damn beautiful cold shower a day. It is not difficult. And the investment is by far the outcome. You get so much more energy and so much more peace because the stress will go out of your body. We can think of muscles, right? Everyone understands muscles. And they know if you go to the gym and work your muscles, they will grow stronger. So as you were describing that about cold showers, I'm thinking we live these comfortable lives. We have temperature controlled houses. If we go out, we don't want to feel hot. We don't want to feel cold. We put on our jackets and our fleeces. So our blood vessels are never, in some way you could say, are never been exposed to those sort of extremes where our body then responds and adapts. And I guess having that cold shower is an intentional way of providing, I guess, like a, a helpful dose of stress to the, to the vascular system, which will cause it to, to grow back stronger? Is that, is that a fair analogy? 
Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the blood flow is going to be better. The muscle tone is going to be better. The heart rate goes absolutely down. Uh, uh, absence of uh, cortisol presence, uh, thus oxidative uh, stress. And uh, yeah, sleep is better. Anything is better. The hormonal system is be the endocrine system is being fed a lot better. It's all about the blood flow. The blood flow is everywhere in our body. Only we cover up our bodies and thus actually we suffocate our body. We, it's breathing. The, the, the body needs to breathe and the cold shower does it. It compensates for our covering up the rest of the day and we get great uh, amounts of energy back. If someone's listening to this and thinking, okay, when I see what you're saying, I can't take it. I, I, you know, I get cold a lot. You know, I, I, it's too cold for me. What would you say to that person? For the people who have a, a low energy, because when it's cold, they feel sensitive, is because the maintenance of their body is at work at that moment, and it takes all the energy at that moment to maintain a normal uh, 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 core body temperature. And for the rest, they feel like shivering because there's no energy left. Take the cold shower. I know this for thousands of people with problems with the cold, having low energy levels and uh, being sick a lot of times because of the lowering energy. It's a, it's a lower alertness of the uh, immune system. After taking the cold showers, suddenly they burst with a lot more uh, uh, energy. They uh, don't become sick anymore. And it's all logical because yeah. that muscle tone is back. And with that, the oxidative stress goes out. You get more energy. So you will never feel cold anymore. Taking the, taking the cold shower is a hormetic stress uh, exercise. Yeah. A hormetic stress, which actually is positive stress exercise, which neurologically at will makes you able to control your body whenever you get stress out in any shape. Could be emotional stress, mental stress, physical, bacterial, viral, it does not matter. Now at will, because you are the one who goes consciously into the cold shower, you learn to change your neurology, your power of will against any stressor. The cold is only a mirror. The cold is a way to enter into the stress mechanisms inside of the brain. I know you want it, uh, only we have this paradigm in uh, our society that, uh, 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 and that is from the prehistorics when it was called outside, that was the enemy. And uh, it's still built in this, this primal aversion, aversive uh, feeling of, hey, cold out there, no, we have to win out there. No, the cold can be a positive stressor to uh, like a vaccination. It's like a vaccination. It, it feels very much as though with that intentional dose of stress each morning or each evening, you start to build up that immune system resilience, that vascular resilience, that stress resilience, which is going to help you for the other 23 and a half hours of the day. And, and that, it feels like exactly. a really exciting practice that we can do. But then you just mentioned a phrase, and it's as I was, um, I was reading your book this morning, and you said, and there's, there's a phrase in it that you just mentioned, which is, the cold is a mirror. And I stopped, I put my drink down, and I read it again. It was one of those phrases that makes me stop and just think, and I think, wow, that's so profound. Because I was then thinking, ah, so if you're someone who doesn't like the cold, that's teaching you something about what else you don't like in life. It's teaching you about your resistance to certain things. I, I don't know, I mean, I wonder if you could expand on that because I think that's a really interesting perspective. The cold is a mirror. Oh yes, the, uh, the cold is a mirror. It shows you how you're physiologically, not only, also mentally, spiritually, are uh, in, in a lockdown when you go into the cold showers. Suddenly it locks down. You, you are paralyzed. 
And, and it could be very much that it has to, got to do with a traumatic experience in the past, that it has psychosomatically has set in. And you think it is the cold. Oh, I don't like the cold. No, you got to solve something because that old trauma is coming to the surface when you take a cold trigger, which takes away your normal conditioning. You have to learn to let go. And that learning to let go at that moment is so beautiful because very soon after you go into the cold shower, suddenly you feel, oh, I can do this. I can even sing. I can make a dance. And, uh, wow, and I feel so great. Yes, that is the nature of trauma, blockages, fears, our, uh, our uh, concept of, uh, of, what, uh, uh, of what the cold is. It is a great way to get into the depth of who you are and what you are. If you learn about the cold and you see you can learn to let go therein, then suddenly you will see that you are ready for any stressor. Like you look in the mirror in the morning, do I look right? Yeah, maybe this hair, a little bit this way, and nice, uh, good, yeah, I'm ready. So if you take the cold shower, you are going to be ready for any kind of stress in the world. And that could be uh, soliciting for a job or get a big deal or a marriage or you want to ask your, your future wife, uh, uh, would you please marry with all your brilliance of being? Uh, all that you got within the control because yeah. you learn to tap into uh, the, uh, the, the fullness of your blood flow, the fullness of being by going into the cold shower, you break the conditioning and you step out uh, 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 into the fullness of your whole being. And then suddenly the flow is there and that becomes one with who you are, what you are in your consciousness. Because in the end, the consciousness is that what they say still 16%. We showed 100%. 100 yeah. It's, it's like a little baby in your hands. There's nothing wrong with the baby. It, the, fee, the, the legs, there's nothing wrong with the baby. It's a beautiful baby, but it is still not able to walk. Yeah. It takes a little time to neurologically set. It takes a little time to neurologically set the access and uh, uh, linking up into all the parts of our brain. But that's the way nature meant us to be, to learn to walk spiritually strong, being brilliant and full bloom, uh, realized the soul as it is the purpose of our life. That's a cold shower. Yeah. That's a mirror. I mean, you, you might be able to see uh, just behind me there on the wall. And yeah, they already intrigued me. Did it intrigue you? Yes. Yeah, so for people watching on YouTube, uh, there's, I, I talk to my kids a lot about this stuff, but we do a bit of breathing together. And I talk to them about my favorite Viktor Frankl quote. And my daughter has summarized it there. Between stimulus and response is a space. And in that space, it's choice. That's her summary of what daddy's been teaching her. Wow. And, and I thought about that in the context of the cold shower. You're saying, and I know breathing would come into this as well, but these regular daily practices help, you know, help grow that space between stressor and response. You make that space bigger, right? So you can actually start to choose the way you respond to the world rather than the world kind of, you know, making you almost a slave to it. So you're just responding and reacting to everyone around you. You start to be in control of your life. Exactly. Just over a year ago, uh, I have mentioned this on the podcast before. I, I, I went and did something called a swim run event where you, uh, you know, you, you're in a wetsuit and, and your trainers and you run in your wetsuit, then you jump in the ocean, you swim, and then you get out and you run and then you swim. I went and signed up for an event, even though I'd never, ever been in the ocean before to swim. And, you know, maybe a hundred meters in, I freaked out. I was scared. I had a panic attack. It was cold. It was, you know, it was in, it was in the UK uh, early on in the season. So the ocean was still very cold. I had never done it before. And in that moment, I, you know, I was scared. Now, I did manage to overcome it and then complete the whole race, which I was very, very proud of. Um, but 
That was cold exposure. That was fear of never having been in the ocean before. And I suspect now talking to you that had I, let's say for two months prior to that, taken a cold shower every day and done your breathing practice every day, of course, I'll never know. But I suspect that maybe I wouldn't have reacted in that way. Maybe I would have been used to the cold. Maybe I would have had a tool to control my breath in that moment. I mean, what do you think? Yes, I get people within two days, even the, they are 80 years uh, of age and never have been in an ice bath. And even with uh, heart problems like cardiac uh, uh, bypasses. And uh, uh, yes, and uh, they tell me and I, I, to, I learn to have them at ease with feeling, uh, uh, go into the ice bath, breathe, uh, as I've taught them, it's not difficult. And um, they are able to stay within two days or even within one day to stay like for two minutes in freezing ice water yeah. and be completely in control. And this is only showing that people of any age are ac actually innately capacitated to meet their stressor and they it's built in only we are so conditioned and so conditioned in our mindset that we panic when we do not have our control anymore while our control should be over much more inside yeah. but we never got into that it's like the house only 16 percent of the house you think is yours no it's all the house there is much more to meet and the cold shows you could stay there in the water you completed it but it was uh, at the cost of a sort of a panic moment and uh, yeah. feeling uh, painful uh, maybe at, at that moment but you got through you got at that moment through your own conditioning that what otherwise you would not have survived but uh, your conditioning got passed and then you let go and you could do it. That's what you saw. And so it is, we have a limited con uh, a power through our conditioned brain. And then uh, we are in fear with that what possibly is able to happen in our lives, like stresses of any kind, emotional, mental, uh, uh, bacterial, any kind of stressor, because we are too much learned and schooled that we are not able to take yeah. on those stresses. And I tell now the people, the cold has shown me, and the cold has shown me how to control the stress mechanisms inside my brain, which makes me able to deal about with any kind of stress. And in the end, it is to get on my path to the realization of my soul and the purpose is to get through any kind of stressor coming to you in peace through observation contemplation toward the realization of my goal and that sounds far-fetched but here it is that is going to be the new paradigm where everybody is able to take on any stress and that's what we have to teach the people uh, it is there guys we, we found ways, very accessible, very effective, and scientifically endorsed, that enabled you to take on uh, the stress in your life much better because you will learn to have a control over the stress mechanisms inside of you. And this was not before, but now it's here. When someone's underneath the cold water, right, first of all, how cold does it need to be? Does it need to be cold enough to give them a shock is the first question. Then the second question, just to be super practical, you can have cold water over your head and you can tense up and last 10 or 15 seconds if you have to, but that's gonna be very different than if you have the cold water and you lean into it and you relax and you breathe. So for people who feel inspired to go, okay, all right, Wim, I'm going to try and have a cold shower. What is the minimum amount of time they need? 
what is the temperature they need it to be, and is there a difference if they're tense or whether they're relaxed and slow breathing? Exactly. So first of all, know that everybody is uh, capacitated by nature, by birthright, to go into this stressful uh, natural environment called the cold. So a cold shower is cold. A cold shower you are able to take on any any day. That that's the first one to know. Now, if you're if you are in a vascular condition which has been alienated from going into the cold stress ever, then of course you have to take it step by step. But it goes very fast. You begin with a, a, a hot shower, and then you get into the last. 30 seconds of cold. Turn it to cold, and then your, uh, uh, your vascular system is very well able to, in this case, passively, because you got into the heat of the hot shower, then pa it works like a sauna, and then go have a cold dip. It's passive, because you got a lot of heat, and so you are able to lose a lot of heat passively through taking on the cold shower. But 30 seconds to begin with is activating, igniting the memory cells within you, the genome expressions in the cell to adapt to the situation. That's the way the DNA works. So in 30 seconds, it's able to be activated to give this spark of neural activity that, uh, uh, that uh, initiates a different neural activity that uh, directly influences into the vascular system. The vascular system and the neuro uh, neurology are uh, tied together and uh, they know how to act. And in the uh, 30 seconds uh, to begin with, anybody can do that. And from 30 seconds, the other day you do 40 seconds, 50 seconds, up to two minutes. In 10 days, everybody is able to take for two minutes a cold shower, two, three minutes. And uh, at that point, you are back at your natural condition of your vascular system. It's when you are able to get into, say, natural bodies of water, like in the UK, in wintertime. And uh, uh, we are, in the end, mammals, guys. And it's great to feel the mammal inside, because it's very powerful. You know that mammals are very powerful in weather. They sleep outside in rain and the cold and this and that. See how far we got away from that. Yeah. So once a day, getting into a cold shower, everybody is able to do. And with that, uh, it's, it, it, the outcome is tremendous. It's, Many books can be written just on the outcome of what a cold shower is doing. Physically, mentally, uh, astrally, uh, uh, spiritually, uh, 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 emotionally. It's all different bodies at work because it all relates to a great blood flow. The transportation of ours, the vascular system is being uptoned through the cold shower. So, so, so in the winter in the Netherlands, if you were to go into a lake, right, a cold, natural lake, you're going to go with no wetsuits. Is that right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, wetsuits, no. And, okay, so... I have no money for wetsuits, so... Uh... <laughs> okay, so look, let's say then, it's July now in the UK as we have this conversation, right? If I have a cold shower from now, every day until winter, uh, yes. I, right. Do you think I can in November or December, whether here or whether I fly out to see you, do you think I can also swim in a lake that's just super cold without wetsuits? Yes. Always take it easy. Remember the breathing. The breathing, we haven't been talking about the breathing yet. We're, we're coming to that. We'll get to that for sure. Yes. So uh, I say so you yes. Think it's, you think it's possible? Yes. yes, absolutely. I train people within two days to do in incredible stuff. And it's amazing because it's only two days. Yeah. What, is the, uh, what is happening when people suddenly double their push-ups without breathing? 
when they are suddenly able to do endurance feats, and they, they, uh, they thought of they could not do even the half of it. And then within two days, it doubles. What is that? And then going into the cold, like freezing ice water, how to do that? And going, yes, within 25 minutes, up to three minutes without air in the lungs. Yeah. That is tapping into a greater potential within yourself. And that is only the start. That's only the beginning. Only the start. Yeah. So I want to get to the breath, but just to finish off on the cold, then, if you don't mind, um, when they're in the cold shower, do they then need to do anything with their breath? Or, you know, is, is there something people should be trying to do? Or they just need to tolerate the cold for as long as they can? What, yeah, what is, don't, what is, don't cramp up, follow the breath. Don't cramp up, don't co no contraction of uh, your muscles. You can, what, uh, what do you do uh, is when you uh, really feel cold, and uh, it's not cold right now, guys. The cold shower is good, it's thermogenesis. You are exercising the vascular system when you take a cold shower now. That is great. But in winter, you're gonna meet your true self within the elements of nature. And that is a great experience. And that, for that, we condition our vascular system. And it always goes through long out breaths. This is the way you go into the cold shower and then the body is able not to get into panic, not into paranoia, no, it's able to adapt. The thermogenesis is able to do what the body is able to do. If you do this, <laughs> then the body is not able to do what the body is able to do. And then can you build up from this into, let's say, if you have a bath in your house, you can run a bath with cold water and then you can take a cold bath as well? Is that, is that, is that like a progression along the sort of oh, cold yes. pressure? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. And listen, if you, if you don't make it, just take on one of my... Uh, we have a free app. You know, we built an app. Yeah. And that app is for free. So it has all what you need. Yeah. What's it called? So, uh, I don't know what's called, but it, it, it's the Wim Hof method yeah. uh, dot com. And there is an app. I never, I, I used the app once, I know, together with my son. And I have to say, it works. <laughs> and I, I took it on. I was listening to myself. I did the breathing uh, together uh, uh, with my voice, together with my son. And we had a great time. But uh, yeah, man, it, uh, uh, I don't know how I got there. It was my son who yeah. uh, activated the app on the phone. So I don't know exactly, but it is for free. And yeah. every month we make sure we, we uh, I don't know, we pay about 10,000 euros a month to embedder the app. And it's all for free. So we want everybody to know this, that health is at your choice that the breathing, the cold exercises endorsed by science are fully there, fully exposed. So there is no confusion about it. It's very clear, very effective, very accessible, and very powerful, it really is. So the, uh, uh, that's about uh, the cold and the breathing. Yeah, and, let's uh, go to the breathing. Yes, let's, let's go move to the breathing. breathing. I mean, before we do, could we just say the cold if all you do, right, is take a cold shower each day and you do nothing with your breath, right? Even that, I'm guessing, will have some benefit, but the benefit is magnified if you also do the breathing. Is that right? Absolutely, absolutely. It, 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 here comes in the power of the mind. Because once you learn to control your breath, going into the cold shower, you enter into changing... A, 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 a getting a hold on the stress upon the body through holding your breath to stay on with the breath and with that you only it's the beginning of getting into the stress mechanisms inside the brain wow. and then the unlocking of the potential to neurologically control the stress mechanisms of your brain is beginning and it can go very fast can go very fast that you learn to control what you could not control in the past, which then created fear instead of confidence. 
Now you will learn to have confidence because your brain now is able to be uh, entered into the stress mechanisms to activate it whenever you need it. It's like instead of uh, uh, being helpless, suddenly you have a gun in your hand. You are powerful. You are powerful against the stressor coming in. I'm, I, I, I'm not into war, guys. Uh, and, uh, uh, I'm not a cowboy. I'm into peace. And bringing peace is bringing a true confidence that you are able to, uh, uh, to uh, confront yourself with any kind of stressor. Is, that is the way you bring peace to yourself because you are not on the watch out. Hey, is it going to come? Oh, 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 my work. Oh, uh, this, oh, that. All that you learn to pacify within, to observe. That's what the cold does. And, uh, and the breathing together exponentially is a stairway to the mind. And that's what we have shown. It's, it's quite mystic. It was all very esoteric before. And now it's gone and become very accessible and effective for people. Pretty much every chronic long-term health complaint stroke condition that we have, yeah. in many ways, the immune system plays a central role. And I don't think people realize that. No, no. And why do you think that might be? I mean, when I was an undergraduate and learning about the immune system, it was through the lens of infection protection. And that kind of is a historical thing, you know, from maybe over a hundred years ago when the first kind of ties were made between these white blood cells and susceptibility to infection. And we've just always maintained this lens through which we look at the immune system as protecting us from infection. And then suddenly you start to dive into the field of immunology and you realize it's not just protecting us from infection, it's doing a whole array of other things. And I, I kind of um, like to move away from that military analogy we often have about the immune system as going out to battle off the germs because most of the time it's not doing that. Most of the time it's kind of like your housekeeper. You know, it's just taking care, it's working hard, it's it's learning from your environment inside and outside, and it's processing all that information and it's maintaining the kind of status quo yeah. in your body. Yeah, I like that. I, th I think a lot of us do think um, still to this day that, oh, if I get cold symptoms in November, mm -hmm. my immune system in inverted commas, kicks in yes. to fight it off. Exactly. But the immune system is constantly running. It's constantly working. It? Yeah. Right now, as we sit here, it's working hard. It's involved in so many processes, you know, like cells in your body have a finite lifespan. So eventually they die and they have to be disposed of and special immune cells are removing those and keeping things tidy. They're repairing damage when it happens, yeah. even if there's no infection. So last year I broke my arm, but I didn't rip the skin open. There was no infection getting in there, but there was still signs of my immune system working hard to, to knit that all back together. Yeah. So it's it's sensing. It's a real kind of, uh, it's like a mobile brain, I think. It's, it's very dynamic and it's listening, integrating all these signals from our environment, from inside us, and then producing the appropriate response to kind of keep things in balance. Yeah. And what's fascinating for me is that, and I hope we get into this today, is that it's not something passive that we have no influence over. There mm. is a lot that we can do, a lot of it quite simple stuff. Yes that can positively impact how our immune system works. Yes. And I know you've, you, you know, you, you, you basically done a fabulous job of summarizing it in your, in your book, Immunity, the Science of Staying Well, which is well worth a read, I think, for anyone who's interested mm -hmm. in learning more about the immune system and how they can use the lifestyle to help them. So mm -hmm. well done on such a great job. Thank you. Let's sort of dive in some. Should we, should we start with food? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's a good place to start. I put the food chapter at the end because I was really sick of 
seeing, you know, the whole immune boosting food supplement, whatever being pushed on, you know, the media, social media, everything. So I was kind of like, people are going to want to open a book about immunity and expect to see on like the first page, vitamin C does this to your yeah. immune cells. So take a vitamin C supplement or eat these vitamin C rich foods. And I kind of just wanted to emphasize it's not that simple, you know, and, and almost um, make people look at the other aspects yeah. of lifestyle I, first. I mean, before, before you dive into food, I, I just want to, I, I, I love that you did that. <laughs> and, um, it's what I did in the Four Pillar Plan, my first mm-hmm. book. I thought I'm not people are expecting this will start with food i'm not going to start with yeah. food i'm going to start with stress because i think that's what no one's thinking about yeah but then i'm interested so you did that in your book but when the book came out yeah and you started to write you know articles or a bit of yes. pr in newspaper columns yes i bet you or i'm going to guess what were they wanting you to say oh, and definitely. write about yeah it was all about you know my book came out in march which was you know covid pandemic you know going through the roof so all of the press and publicity was you know how can we make ourselves invincible to COVID? What what supplements can we take to be invincible? <laughs> and I was yeah. going to let everyone down and say, well, you know, nothing's going to make you invincible because <laughs> from the dawn of time, we've always had this battle with with germs, you know, like they're trying to infect us. We're trying to keep them out. We just cohabit this earth together. So there's always going to be infection yeah. and a pandemic's an unfortunate situation, but it's a very real one. Yeah. I mean, I'd love people just to sit with what you said there, which is we all cohabit this earth together, us mm-hmm. and the bugs. <laughs> you know, it's it's really quite profound that, mm-hmm. you know, it's not, I think humans, have, we've we've often felt, I think particularly in the times that I've been around on, on, on planet mm-hmm. earth, that, you know, we kind of know best and we sort of, we can dominate everything around yeah. us. But I think we're learning, well... We Mother, don't know Mother, Nature's, it, right? <laughs> pre- Mother Nature's pretty powerful and they've yeah. been around a long, long time. And there's, yeah. there's a certain ebb and flow, there's a certain dynamic. Mm-hmm. We are not the only um, living species in the world. There's animals, yeah. there's bugs and bugs as no, no doubt we'll get into, yeah. bugs are not all bad. There's a lot of bugs. Yes, exactly. They're very I mean, good. 99% of them won't hurt us and they're everywhere. They're, you know, right now as we're sitting here, there's there's bugs even in the air we breathe and they're not, you know, causing us harm. Yeah. So most of them are good, but there's the obvious ones that come along and, um, you know, sideswipe you like um, SARS-CoV-2 has yeah. uh, as a sort of reminder, a stark reminder that, yeah, infection protection is really important. Yeah, and I, th- I think I think the the thing I would sort of reiterate to people is what I think the last few months have highlighted for mm-hmm. us is that looking after your immune system mm-hmm. is really important. Yes, and I would say I've said it's a lot in the press, like taking care of your immune system is for life. It's not just for, for COVID, you know, suddenly everybody's really interested in it. There's lots of marketing of immune boosting products, you know, all of the supermarkets and and pharmacies were sold out of vitamin C supplements at the start of the lockdown. Um, But it's something that we should all have been thinking of before COVID because it's, it's, it's for the long game, you know, immunity is really entwined with how we age. So, you know, if you want to live a long and and healthy life, we are as a population living much longer than the generations before us, but we're not necessarily living better. So if you want to, you know, I don't necessarily want to live forever, but I want to be able to enjoy my years and feel well and not be sort of burdened with chronic disease. And we can't bulletproof ourselves, but there's definitely things we can do now that that are for the long game. And when I wrote the book, it was before we knew about um, the current coronavirus pandemic. So I was really hoping to try and get people thinking about the long game for their health. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, it, I'm sure in many ways, people, if they weren't going to take it seriously before, mm-hmm. are really going to now. So yeah. that will be our hope. So in terms of the things people can do, yeah. Uh, if we if we sort of dive into diet and food then, exactly. um, what are some of the things that people can do to help their immune system? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a sort of 
ones that people often think about, which is vitamins and minerals. And we have a whole um, selection of essential, we call them micronutrients. So the vitamins and minerals that we need to function. And if you're deficient in any of those, you will impair your immune system. And I think that there's certain ones that are highlighted. So vitamin A, the B vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin D, and vitamin E. But you could sort of say that taking more than than you need if you're not deficient isn't going to make your immune system work better than it already does at its baseline. But the sort of subclinical deficiencies in our populations are not really clear. It's very hard to measure. You know, if somebody has an overt deficiency in vitamin D, you would see it clinically as rickets. But if they're subclinically deficient, that would sort of fly under the radar. Yeah. And being subclinically deficient is in one micronutrient is often a sign that there's other micronutrients that might not be quite at the right um, yeah. levels. And I, I, for people who, I just want to clarify for people that subclinical, so, you know, a lot of people are used to getting blood tests mm -hmm. and there's a normal range. Mm -hmm. um, and often if you are with, you know, out with that normal range, you will be, it will said you are deficient. Yeah. Um, but we're learning more and more like B12, for example, is a, a prime example for me that the normal range is so big, Yeah, you know, it's something like, you know, 200 ish to 700 or 800, depending on what lab you're mm -hmm. in. But for some people who are at 250, although it's technically normal, mm -hmm. actually it, they're symptomatic with it, mm -hmm. Like they can have, um, you know, they can have all sorts of things, fatigue, they yeah. can have confusion, they can have muscle aches. And I really think medicine, I would say, has been quite black and white for mm -hmm. a number of years. I think we need to evolve a little bit to go, there's optimal. Yeah. You know, there's normal, there's abnormal, but there's also optimal. Yeah. And and and, and I think I think that's just a really important concept for people to grasp. Yeah. And I you know, um if you're if you know have problems with any of these micronutrients the vitamins and minerals it's going to impact your immune system so it's not so simple as saying i'll take a vitamin c supplement and that's going to make me more invincible so it doesn't quite work like that um the other thing about the micronutrients is if we're low in any of those, it can actually increase oxidative stress in our body. So this is kind of the balance between oxidants and antioxidants. And what we've actually come to realize is this can affect how badly uh, an infection causes us symptoms. So if you're in a more oxidative state, so you're not... Um, your imbalance of antioxidants to oxidants is out, that bug, if you, if you catch a, an infection like you know, coronavirus, for example, it can cause a much worse pathology in you. And it can also cause that virus to be under a greater pressure to mutate, to become more virulent. So let's, let's take a, a winter flu, for example, a winter flu type virus that we are exposed to. Are you saying then that the state of your immune system at that time mm -hmm. potentially can influence whether you actually get sick with that infection yeah. or whether you fight it off with no yeah. problem. And how sick you get and whether you, the environment that your body provides when that infection is inside you can shape how that um, infection behaves, how that virus might be under a more pressure to mutate or more likely to mutate because of the, the environment of your body, which so is really... Is this why you can have 10 people in the same room with the same person with, let's say, a uh, cold virus coughing all over mm -hmm. 10 of them, but not all 10 will get symptoms of the virus, will they? Yes, exactly. And we've known this for a really long time, but I think coronavirus and the current pandemic has really kind of put that under the microscope because people are like, why are some people getting really, really sick and others have no symptoms? And yeah. this is quite commonly seen with infections that we have this huge diversity of yeah. how we respond. Now, now, you mentioned oxidative stress and this balance between the oxidative stress and the antioxidants. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you, we could just make that super clear for people. So what is oxidative stress exactly? So we have um, oxidative, like things that are, are produced when uh, like 
byproducts of, of our cells normally working, um, things in our environment, various different things can, can cause that oxidative yeah. stress in our body. And then we have our own internal antioxidant systems. We have the micronutrients, vitamins and minerals that support production of antioxidants. And we also get antioxidants from food. And we kind of need this to be in balance. So we don't want to completely extinguish the oxidative side and we don't want to um, have too few antioxidants because they both play roles in different ways. And just being alive and functioning mm -hmm. and going around your day yeah. today is going to increase oxidative stress, isn't yeah. it? Because it's a normal, it's like all these things you want it, you, as you say, it's a balance. You mm -hmm. want that, but you want enough going on in your lifestyle to balance that out? Is, yes. that, is that what I we're saying? I think that's a, a good way to put it. And Oxidative stress is something that our immune cells do when they're fighting an infection because they want to make our body's environment very hostile to the infection. So they produce all these kind of um, reactive oxygen species like free radicals and stuff to try and fight off infections and make that environment hostile. And then you have the antioxidants that's going to quench that and bring things back to normal once you no longer need to be fighting the infection. So is this why it's a good idea to eat uh antioxidant rich foods because it helps yes, with this balance exactly and a lot of the minerals and vitamins in our diet are sort of cofactors in all of the processes that are involved in achieving this balance and then you have all the kind of phytonutrients so these are plant chemicals that are not considered in the recommended daily allowance like we we don't have a sort of reference amount that you should be taking uh, and has 20 odd thousand of them recorded so far so um they're kind of the, the the things that plants use as their own defense system because they cannot run away when an, a little um you know insect comes along and tries yeah. to bite it so they'll produce their own little chemicals phytochemicals that will try and um, make it hostile and when we eat these they help our own internal antioxidant systems and they also have their antioxidant properties themselves wow. so that's why we should focus on like a plant-rich diet and most of these phytonutrients are found in the pigments of different plants so something i do with my kids is that we talk about eating different colors and you know red fruits and vegetables we have leafy greens orange fruits and vegetables um yellow then even like the browns and whites like cauliflower yeah. and those kind of things um and uh, the purples and the blacks you know the real and uh, that are found in berries and kind of trying to eat from a whole range of these foods rather than focusing on one particular phytonutrient like curcumin and turmeric so that's one that we commonly see in the sort of wellness arena that people take um supplements of yeah. this and i think the, the uh, most uh, sort of basic thing that you should think about is that they work in concert like an orchestra. So you don't want to isolate one particular phytonutrient or antioxidant and put it in a pill and take it because you might actually be removing some of its power because it's not being consumed in situ of all the other phytonutrients and um, parts of your diet that help with that digestion and absorption. So I think food first, food first is what everyone should be thinking of when it comes to their immune system. Trying to get your nutrition from food so that you're not deficient in any of the micronutrients, which are the vitamins and minerals, and then getting all these phytonutrients, which are kind of like the icing on the cake to really um, nourish our immune system. And they have their own natural antioxidant properties. Some of them are antimicrobial, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, and they're often considered longevity compounds. So we know that we don't need a certain amount to be able to function, but we know that over the course of a lifetime, they're very important yeah. for longevity. So, I, I, you know, food first seems really simple. And if you have a chronic condition or some underlying health problem, then you might, that might not be an approach that works for you. But I think that is the best thing that we can sort of aim for. I think that's a nice approach. It's it's saying, look, there may be some value in some supplements at some time, depending on your mm -hmm. state of health, but let's get the basics right first. Yeah. Let's focus on food yeah. first. And it's the pattern of the, your diet. It's the consistency. It's not what you ate this morning, but what did you eat all week? What did you eat all month? You know, maybe you had a few meals that were not the best, but if the majority, if the pattern overall is 
is strong, then I think that's that's what you need to be looking at rather than getting stressed about every meal being perfect. Yeah, and that's a very empowering message, I think, for people because, you know, we are living in stressful times. People mm -hmm. do sometimes struggle with energy or motivation mm -hmm. to you know, cook that perfect meal yeah. that they want to, but your approach is saying, look, that's okay, right? Don't beat yourself up. If, yeah. if now and again, you have a meal that isn't, let's say what you would ideally have, okay, fine. Yeah. Maybe enjoy it. You know, exactly. don't, don't feel guilty about it, Yes, but try to make most of your meals as much as possible, yes, exactly. um, you know, natural, minimally mm -hmm. processed foods i would like i think so one of the one of the tips you're saying is colors focus on as many colors. different colors yep exactly rather than maxing out on one color yes. you're saying go for a variety go for a variety and the other thing is you know food when you focus on food first it's it's conveniently packaged up with other things that your body needs and one of the key things that is often not linked to your immune system but i'd say it's like massive for the, the resilience of your immune system is fiber. So pills and, and potions and whatever are not full of fiber, but the fresh produce is full of fiber. And people might be thinking, why is fiber important for your immune system? Because your gut bugs, the microbiota at the interface of your digestion and the rest of your body are one of the key educators of the immune system. You did mention saturated fats. Um, let's just quickly go through the macronutrients then. like Because yes. there was a really nice bit in the book about protein and immunity, which I found yeah. really interesting. Um, but saturated fat is is a very hot topic of mm -hmm. conversation and uh, how can I put it, the Twitter diets wars. Yes. Um, <laughs> I definitely steer clear of that. Yeah, I, I, I do these days. I'm just like, okay, I'm, I'm over it really. I, sort yeah. of, I don't find it particularly helpful. Um, but also when we talk about saturated fat, there's so many different types of saturated fat. It gets quite a nuanced mm -hmm. discussion, but I wonder if you could, let's talk about protein. Maybe we mm -hmm. can talk about fats and carbs and actually yeah. how you see them impacting the immune system. Exactly. So I think carbs is the quality and the quantity. So these are where we're getting the fiber to feed our microbiota. So um, thinking of that diverse, colorful produce that we're trying to eat 30 different plant foods and over the course of a week. Um, carbohydrates are fueling our immune responses. Um, and then protein. I think protein malnutrition is probably globally one of the biggest factors that has a negative impact on our immune system because it's, it's protein breaks down into amino acids. And these are the building blocks to make so many other proteins in our bodies. And the immune system is a huge sink for that because it needs, you know, antibodies are made from protein. The communication molecules are made protein from protein. So we need protein for the fabric of yeah, our immune system. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's probably one of the key things, like as I said, globally that impacts our immunity. Uh, what's sort of less understood is which particular amino acids, these building blocks of proteins are more or less uh, important for different aspects of the immune system. Yeah. And I think that's something we'll see coming out in the next few years under this kind of immunometabolism field. Um, I think you beautifully addressed animal versus plants uh, in the book where you said, you know, animal proteins are typically more complete yeah but plant-based proteins a lot of cultures have actually learned how to combine them yeah to give you that completeness and i thought that was a very inclusive and a very empowering way because people you know people these days are choosing to eat yes. in very different ways and yeah. of course choosing how you eat is a very modern it's quite a privileged phenomenon in yeah. the first place to be able to choose exactly. the diet you wish to follow yeah um, but i thought it was really nice how you did that yeah and what are some of those examples of combining so i think um i think rice and beans i think you put that in one. yeah yeah and and you find these in sort of different uh, cultural diets as well and the complete proteins the complete proteins are the ones that contain all of the amino acids that are considered essential we cannot make them ourselves and then there's certain amino acids that we can make ourselves um, and there's some that are conditionally essential so in certain situations yeah. they become essential so most animal products tend to um you know, generally speaking, contain all the essential ones, whereas most plant products tend to only contain some or other of them, but you can piece them together. And I think anyone who's switching out all animal products for plant-based uh, protein sources should really 
make sure they get some sort of nutritional advice to ensure that they're not lacking in any of these amino acids. And, they, and, and study traditional diets, I guess, mm-hmm. or traditional cultures yeah. who eat that way. You know, there is a lot of kind of ancestral wisdom there mm-hmm. that we've known as humans before that yeah. we've sort of forgotten, Maybe right? it's the human condition, you know, like when our parents <laughs> try and tell us stuff and we're like, no, we'll do it anyway. Yeah. Um, and then we're like, oh yes, they were right. That's what they were trying to tell us. So yeah. I think right, we all know that. Pedal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so what, what's the deal with fats then? So fats, um, I think for a long time, we kind of thought of fat as one thing, but it's not. It's lots of different things. Um, there's the unsaturated fats. So there's the mono and the polyunsaturated fats. So olive oil is probably the best example of a mono unsaturated fat. And there's lots of um, epidemiological research around why it's important for health. And it has lots of these phytonutrients that I mentioned earlier included in it. And my own personal bias because of my hybrid uh, Italian family is like, you know, oil, olive oil is life. <laughs> so it's all that I use and um, yeah, hold my hands up to that. Um, so it's it's something that's um, really important to include uh, in your diet. I think people get afraid of cooking with olive oil, but it's for the short term sort of home cooking, it's been shown to be stabilized by the presence of these phytonutrients. Yeah. So it's, it's a good healthful oil to use. And, you know, people have been using it for millennia and uh, it's associated with some of the most healthful diets in the world, like the Mediterranean region. Um, then the polyunsaturated fats are kind of interesting because you have the omega-3 and the omega-6. So some people might be familiar with these. Omega-3 supplements are quite popular now. Um, and I would say that if you're not eating oily fish, then you should really think about an omega-3 supplement because these are... They're making up the, the the cell membranes of our, our cells, but their immune system is using these as a resource to produce different um, molecules that it uses to do its job. And um, this includes production of inflammation, but also resolution of inflammation. And resolution of inflammation was something that was really neglected in the, the field for a long time. It's only maybe 10 years ago that we started to understand, oh, it's an active process. Inflammation just, just doesn't go away by itself. Simply the act of having inflammation in the body, having the presence of certain inflammatory cell types causes the switch to the next phase, um, which is the pro-resolving um, resolution of inflammation, which is healing and repair. And this is where our immune cells utilize these omega-3 fats from their cell membrane to produce pro-resolving molecules that help dampen down this and and heal and repair the the body that that is super fascinating so you know we we, we were saying at the start that inflammation is a normal process mm-hmm. you know it's but it's it's meant to be short-lived so it's mm-hmm. meant to be there to help you fight something like a you know a broken ankle you yes. know sorry sprained ankle you don't mm-hmm. get red hot yes swollen for a few days and then it resolves yeah. the the chronic inflammation the chronic unresolved inflammation that's behind you know, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, yeah. a lot of cases of depression, yes. all kinds of autoimmune diseases yeah. is a sort of chronic unresolved inflammation. And you're mm-hmm. saying that omega-3s help to resolve inflammation. Yes. Which is, which is you know, it's, it's quite nice actually to be able to draw a direct yeah. sort of link. So, oh, that's going to help me, you know, in, in colloquial terms, switch it off, I guess, yes. to a certain degree. And you have to also consider whatever stimulating the inflammation in the first place needs to be somehow removed or yeah. contained as well. There's a lot of studies in things like heart disease, depression. I think probably um, rheumatoid arthritis is one that springs to mind because there's, you know, dozens of um uh, clinical trials now that show that high doses of omega-3 is really bef- beneficial to the overall um, patient's quality of life and you know their pain and um, disease management but yet the nice guidelines are still not suggesting that we treat people with this it's still that they're welcome to explore something like a Mediterranean diet. So for me, rheumatoid arthritis is the one that holds the strongest evidence, but it's just challenging to get that into clinical practice, I think. There's also things like allergies where omega-3s, the evidence is really quite mixed, but we have 
a sort of picture appearing where what the mother is eating when she's pregnant and the fish, um, which is a great source of omega-3s, is really important to help prevent allergies in the unborn child. So again, not a really strong um, clinical message yet, but I think that's some something that we're going to see coming out in the next few years. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is one of the big problems at the moment is with how information is communicated. Mm -hmm. um, we can easily get overexcited by yeah. certain things. But at the same time, I also think we put the brakes on a lot of things as well. Of course, we often need more evidence, but I also think sometimes with some things... Mm -hmm when the risk of harm is low, yeah. we should really be starting to think about, well, look, and when, you, when, for example, we say mixed evidence, that implies, well, some evidence is suggesting it may yeah. work and some is suggesting it, it's not. So it could be that in certain populations, yes. it works brilliantly. Exactly. And in other populations, it doesn't work at all. But no, we're going to have a global recommendation that you don't do it because we don't have the evidence. Yeah. And I just don't think it's... I really think we need to think about a better way sometimes to communicate some yeah. of this with the public it's really hard especially you know the thing with pregnant women and and fish because there's mixed messages about how much fish pregnant women should mercury intake because of mercury yeah. but yet we we're starting to see a picture where having omega-3s are really important during pregnancy but pregnant women might decide to not eat fish at all during pregnancy rather than the kind of gray area of you're allowed so many portions but not yeah. this fish and only so many times a week um and in which case then maybe a supplement would be suitable but that's not again it's it's very difficult to communicate yeah um this kind of information into very clear yeah. public health messages in terms of saturated fats mm -hmm. um you have written about this in the book uh, i think you cover it really well um as i say there's lots of different kinds of saturated fats mm -hmm. and i think sometimes I, I find it confusing in the literature as to it's a specific type or they often it's an animal study with a high sucrose high saturated yeah. fat diet so you're conf one might be confusing sort of the high sugar and the high fat exactly. diet in combination. And I, I sort of think some people seem to be do okay with a little bit of saturated fat in the context of a natural yeah. sort of more traditional diet. And I think that's exactly. where, and as you yourself said at the start, it's very hard when we just go to individual yeah. nutrients and try and say good or bad. Exactly. It's kind of a lot more nuanced. Yeah. So we do know that saturated fat can be something that causes the gut barrier to open up uh, more than other um, foods. And that in itself can cause this sort of transient post-eating post inflammation. But we also know that eating it in the context of a fiber-rich diet is going to kind of counterbalance that. And I think no food is just 100% saturated yeah. fat. Every food has a mix of different nutrients. So we're not just eating saturated fat on its own. Um, but you can eat foods that are higher or lower in saturated fat. Yeah. And for some people, it may be beneficial to, to eat a, a lower saturated fat diet. For other healthy people, maybe it's not even something that needs to be on your radar because your overall pattern yeah. is, is quite balanced. And, and then it also comes down to, doesn't it, like what's your current state of health? So mm -hmm. if you have, for whatever reason had a lot of insults to your body, whether it was stress, poor diets, inadequate movement, insomnia, mm -hmm. maybe you work night shifts for, for 20 years or whatever. Maybe at that point, maybe the gut is a little bit more leaky than, mm -hmm. um, than we would call physiological or, or yeah. normal or optimal. Maybe in that context, foods can start to become problematic. Yeah. On the background of that, compared to someone who's got their their health and their microbiome yeah. in a completely different state. Yeah, exactly. And, and I really, I so strongly feel that that nuance is getting lost in health communication. I really think it gets lost on social media a lot of the mm -hmm. time, where things have become black and white. Yeah. So it's like, and I don't know. I, I I am heavily influenced by my experience as a clinician seeing mm -hmm. patients. I've just realised that. It's very hard to say one thing for sure that is applicable in every single situation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess that's where, you know, we're not <laughs> going to be able to deliver personalized diets to everyone, but we can help sort of nurture intuition and, yeah, yeah and 
steer well, people towards the, the helpful. Sorry to interrupt. If you're enjoying this conversation, there's loads more like it on my channel. Please do press subscribe and hit that bell. Now, back to the conversation. Right now, the recommendation is for most adults, get seven to nine hours of sleep. And to get, by the way, to get seven hours of sleep, you probably need at least a seven and a half hour sleep opportunity. I think that's what many people miss in recommendations from sort of experts. They say, get your seven hours of sleep. So people think that means, you know, well, if I go to bed at, you know, 11 p.m. and I wake up at 6 a.m., then I've got my seven hours of sleep. That's not true. You probably will have only logged about sort of six hours and 40 minutes, and, and that's, that's not enough. So you need to think about the sleep opportunity time as being probably around about eight hours optimally. What we also know is that once you get below seven, we can start to measure objective impairments in your body and in your brain as well. The problem is that most people don't realize that they're sleep deprived when they're sleep deprived. This is a big problem with sleep loss. And, you know, the analogy, I guess, would be um, a drunk driver at a bar. You know, they've had a couple of pints, maybe a few shots. And they pick up their car keys and they say to you, you know, look, I'm fine to drive home. Yeah. And you say, no, I know that you think you f you're fine to drive home, but trust me, you're not. You are objectively, you're impaired. It's the same way with a lack of sleep that our subjective sense is a miserable predictor of objectively how well we're doing with a lack of sleep. And I think that's one of the, um, one of the issues that um, I try to sort of help dismiss uh, in terms of a notion. I think the other thing that's problematic too about getting too little sleep is that your baseline level of how you think your health and your wellness is just becomes chronically low and you accept that as if that's just where I am in life. This is just me, this is as good as it can be. And people don't realize that if you were to change something like sleep or stress or diet or physical activity, there's actually a better form of you waiting on the other side of those yeah, things. Absolutely. It just requires perhaps, you know, some knowledge and an invitation to go there. Matthew, I, I call this podcast Feel Better, Live More for a reason. And it really just echoes what you what you just said then. You know, when we feel better by, you know, prioritizing sleep, by, you know, looking at these other pillars that I talk about we get more out of life. We're, we're a better version of ourselves. We have better relationships. We have, you know, much deeper, more meaningful interactions with the world around us when we're feeling better. And I guess you would argue that when we sleep better, we live more. We do. I mean, firstly, that data is very clear that um, if you look across epidemiological studies, millions of individuals in these studies, a very simple truth comes out, which is that the shorter your sleep, the shorter your life that short sleep predicts all cause mortality. Wow. And so, you know, I think- I think we just need to stop and just let, let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> a little, depriving ourselves from sleep will shorten our life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean- That's the, the, the powerful data that, you know, the global sleep loss epidemic that is underway right now, which I believe is probably one of the greatest public health challenges that we now face um, in the 21st century, it is a slow form of self-euthanasia. It's a very powerful statement, one that I absolutely would agree with. Um, have we, as a society, I don't know if overprioritise is the right word, but um, yeah, let's go with overprioritise. Have we, let, have we put too much focus on the right food and the right physical activity at the expense of sleep? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I've thought about this a lot. Um, I, I don't think we've done it at the expense of sleep, perhaps, but I do resonate with your comment that I think sleep has perhaps been the neglected stepsister in the health conversation of today. And I think it's been left out in the cold. There's a, probably a number of reasons for that. The first is just because scientists like me are to blame. What I mean is that we have not adequately communicated to the public or to medicine or to healthcare professionals in general how critical the importance and necessity of sleep is. You know, and I liken where we are with sleep with where we were um, for smoking 50 years ago. You know, all of the science was there, but it hadn't trickled down yeah. into the public knowledge base or even into medicine. Well, that's what you do so great with your book is you're, you're bringing that awareness to 
the general public all over the world, which is fantastic. And that was part of the motivation for the book. You know, I could see the disease and sickness and ill health that was caused by insufficient sleep. And there wasn't, you know, um, there wasn't a blueprint guide. There wasn't some kind of a, a manifesto for sleep. And so that was part of the reason to write the book. But I think to come back, um, you know, to why sleep has been left out in the cold, I think part of it is people like, you know, well, at least my fault. Um, I think the other thing, too, is that unlike diet and exercise, sleep has an image problem. You know, I think nobody feels ashamed about saying, I went out for a run at lunchtime or, you know, I, I went, I had a great run this morning. Nobody necessarily feels ashamed about, you know, putting salad on their plate, you know, and making a really healthy meal. But I do think people feel sometimes ashamed by saying, well, I, I need at least eight and a half hours of sleep a night, you know, and sometimes I've heard the reaction of people saying, really? And that really has a hint in it to suggest that if you're getting sufficient sleep, and I choose that word carefully, sufficient, then you must be lazy that you're slothful yeah. because we've tagged and we've associated this thing called necessary sleep with that luggage of you know, something to be ashamed about. And in fact, if anything, it's what happens is that people have this braggadocio attitude, this almost sort of sleep machismo attitude that you're very proud to tell people how little sleep that you're getting as though it's, you know, a badge of honor. I see that in some people, not all, not all people, but some people. So I think to change that part of the sleep discussion and bring it into the health equation, we need to destigmatize sleep. Uh, in a way, too. I think those are at least two of the reasons why it's been left out in the cold. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I've shared this before on the podcast that a few years ago, for, for me, it was probably when I had kids, actually, because my kids were early risers. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the understatement of the year that they were <laughs> early risers. But I realized that if I didn't alter my going to bedtime, I was going to be exhausted every single day, which is what was happening. And I, and I sort of altered my whole sleep schedule a few years back. And it's something now that I really do prioritise. You know, I will have a shot of time in the evening, after which I'm not on my computer, I'm not working. I will wait because I know that if I don't do that, the next day I won't be performing at anywhere near the level I want to. Um, and it actually <laughs> reminds me of that, that Facebook conversation we had, the Facebook Live chat we did. Yeah. So guys, we were trying to schedule this chat for a little while. And oh, I love this, yeah. We, we, we put a date in and then uh, Matthew had to move move the time and I got an email, I think, from your publicist saying, you know, can we move this time? And I thought, well, that's 9 p.m. UK time. Man, that's really late because, you know, I've just, I've just written a book saying how important sleep is as well. And I'm you know, trying to educate and inspire my audience that actually these things are really important. So I actually declined your very kind invitation to do it at night. Well, I just yeah. actually asked to see if we could change the time. Yeah, you I, I didn't certainly, know. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't have suggested Yeah, that. I said, guys, look, if, if we chat between 9 and 10 and we talk about how detrimental sleep is and, you know, uh, you know, and, and all the problems associated with it, yet we're doing it late in the evening for my UK audience um, we're ex I'm going to expose everyone to blue light in the evening right, onto <laughs> online devices, emotionally work them up before bed. I thought, actually, you know what? Let's just decline that and do it at another time. So I that, that, was, was, that was quite brilliant. nice. Yeah, that was great, wasn't it? Yeah, we? it was just, you know, for someone to embrace, you know, sort of uh, and practice what they preach. And, you know, and I think for the two of us, you know, a lot of people, of course, will ask me, well, so how much sleep do you get? And I will tell them that I do honestly get a non-negotiable eight hour sleep opportunity every night. And it's n I'm not trying to be, you know, a poster child for sleep. I'm not trying to just sort of promote the book. If you knew the data as I do, and as I hope people um, will after reading the book, honestly, you just would not choose to do anything else. And, you know, I don't want to live a shorter life and I don't want to live a shorter life that is filled with, with disease or sickness. And from everything I can tell, sleep is perhaps one of the most democratic, freely available, efficacious forms of, um, of health insurance that you could ever wish for. And as a consequence, the reason I get that much is because for selfish reasons, you know, I just want to be alive and well for as long as possible. And I think 
you know, it's interesting hearing you say why you prioritize it. You know, again, it's selfish is the wrong word, but it's for self-preservation reasons. Um, and one of the things I actually, if I, if you don't mind, I know you, this is your podcast and you're interviewing hey, me, but talk about whatever but, you want. But but I, but I would love to just ask you the question because you know when I saw the title of of the book, you know, and I saw that you know there on the front cover was this word called sleep. And it was on, part, on, my book. on your on the yeah, on the front cover of your book. Yeah. There was this thing called sleep. Relax, eat, move, and sleep. And I well imagine that the first three would be there, of course, from you know a, an eminent clinician. But I was surprised by the four. I was lovely, excited. You know, it was wonderful. <laughs> but tell me, you know, where did that decision come from to include sleep? You know, where did you get the awareness from? Where did you get the sensitivity to sleep? You know, was it boots on the ground with patients? Was it in a medical curriculum? Was it personal? Tell me. I'd love to know. Yeah, I think, Matthew, that's a, it's a great question, really. I mean, my, I guess, my journey into this um, of, of really being keen to promote lifestyle comes from a, you know, a, a real feeling that in medicine we've lost our way a little bit. Now, we're not putting blame on anyone, yeah, um, yeah. But, I, but I sort of feel that the medical system is set up around acute diseases, acute problems that respond very well to our magic bullet pharmaceutical interventions. But I think the health landscape, even in my career, and I've nearly been seeing patients now for about 20 years, even in my career, I have seen the health landscape of the patients that, that I see change dramatically. Whereas now the bulk of what I see in my daily practice, you know, I say 80% of it is in some way driven by our collective modern lifestyles. Mm. And so I've been delving deep for a few years now in terms of, you know, what are those lifestyle factors that I can leverage with my patients to get a better outcome? And of course, when I first started going on this journey, it was all about food, right? You know, it's like, okay, you know, it's all about diet. You know, and if we were having this chat five or six years ago, I would be saying, you know, most of what happens to us, you know, most of our health determinant is is basically foods. But I disagree now, you know, because I think when you know the science, when you have seen the science, um, as you detail so beautifully in your book, the, the case is compelling. You can't really ignore sleep. So. I'm a doctor who wants to get my patients better like every other doctor. I want to do this in as harmless a way as possible. And I also get very tired of suppressing downstream symptoms. So I want to go upstream as far as possible, see what lever can I turn that's going to have all these downstream consequences. And food is one of those things that, you know, food isn't just calories, you know, it's not just fat and carbs, it's information, it changes our genetic expression. So it's information for the body. In a similar way, physical activity can change hormones, can change genetic expression, all these kind of things. And, you know, so obviously, um, that's food, that's movement. Relaxation is a whole piece about stress, you know, which, you know, some research is showing that 90, up to 90% of what we see in primary care may have stress as a factor, which is incredible. And but I always felt I was missing one piece off the puzzle. And, you know, I would see, like, like if we take autoimmune disease for, for an, as, as an example, when I see my patients, I often do what's called a timeline. And I look, you know, I say, okay, you've got symptoms here today, but let's look at your whole life. Let's see what's been happening sequentially. Because I don't think a lot of these chronic conditions just happen overnight. There's been a buildup for a period of time, for a period of years. And I would often see with autoimmune conditions that you know, just a few months, sometimes just one month before the onset of symptoms, I would see either, a, either, you know, well, not either, I would often see a really stressful episode happen that would reduce the quality of people's sleep. And then I see symptoms come on. Yeah. There was a doctor, I always want to learn from my patients. So, you know, your question is, where does this come from? Well, primarily, it's come from listening to my patients and listening to the stories that they tell me. Because, you know, you're, you know, one of the world's eminent researchers in sleep. I love research, but I also love real life. What happens at the coalface when I'm seeing patients? What do they tell me is working? What do they tell me they're struggling with? That also influences a lot of my recommendations as well as the science. You know, if you can marry those two together, I think that's when we can make a real difference with people. And I also went to a conference in uh, San Diego about two years ago, and the whole conference was on sleep and relaxation and, and rest. And, and 
I think it was uh, Phyllis Zay. Do you know Phyllis? Phyllis C. Yeah. yeah, yeah Phyllis C. Yeah, yeah. She gave a couple of keynotes there. Um, and I thought, God, this really is whetting my appetite. It's really reinforcing what I'm seeing in my practice. As I say, when you look at the research, I thought, well, how can I write a lifestyle book that is that is to empower people to take control of their health and not cover sleep? You know, I can't do it. I, I just, no, I can't, I just can't do so, it. What's so interesting about that is, you know, you had, you know, all of this time at medical school in practice, you know, and it took a conference, yeah. you know, that you, you know, through your own sheer interest and desire My own to money, and my help. own sort of annual leave to go and do this yeah, stuff because yeah. I'm interested. That's where you got your sleep education. And, you know, that that strikes me as, as so, you know, unfortunate you know i want to think i want to work with medical systems to try and increase you know a sleep education component because wouldn't it be wonderful if all of our primary care physicians here in the united kingdom were you know as sleep aware and sleep motivated as you are and i'm sure they would be delighted to receive that information you know i know I have lots of friends here who are who are doctors and you know, I know that they would embrace that and would love to try and increase wellness in their patients, but there's just no pathway that we've engineered in the medical system to gift them with that knowledge and dispense wellness to their patients because sleep really is the tide that raises all of the other health boats. It's just as you said, it's the superordinate node that if you manipulate it, you know, it's like the Archimedes lever, you pull that, everything else you know, can start to come into play. Yeah, the, you get the sleep, but it affects your brain, it affects your hormones, it affects your genetic expression, it affects yep. all these sort of things that we might be looking for drugs to to affect those individual pathways, but you can improve a lot of them by, by improving your sleep. Yeah, you know, and it's no, we, we think, well, that sounds almost too good, but don't forget, you know, it took Mother Nature 3.6 million years to evolve this necessity of eight hours of sleep in place, which I should note, by the way, that if you look at the data, Back in the 1940s, the average adult was sleeping about uh, 7.9 hours of sleep. Now that number here in the United Kingdom is closer to 6 hours and 30 minutes. In other words, within the space of 100 years, which is a blink of an evolutionary eye, we've lopped off almost 20% of our sleep need. You know, how could that not come with demonstrable health and disease consequence? So I think, you know, there's that component there. But I love what you were saying that, you know, in medicine, we're often, or even in research and pharmaceuticals, we're often trying to sort of manipulate one pathway in one area of the metabolic system or one aspect of the immune yeah. system or one feature of the cardiovascular system. And, you know, sleep affects all of those. And we can, you know, I'll give you an example. Firstly, we know that after, if you get a patient and you have them who, um, sleeping just six hours for one week, this is someone, let's say, who is healthy. At the end of that one week of short sleep, their blood sugar levels are disrupted so significantly that they would be pre-diabetic, that you would diagnose them as being in a state of pre-diabetic. Just from sleep um, deprivation. Just from sleep deprivation. We control all of the factors. Um, you can also speak about sleep loss and uh, the cardiovascular system. And all it takes is one hour of lost sleep because there is a global experiment that's performed on 1.6 billion people across 70 countries twice a year, and it's called daylight savings time. <laughs> yeah, And it turns out that when you look at that data in the spring, when we lose an hour of sleep, we see a subsequent 24% increase in heart attacks as a result. It's just incredible. But in the it? autumn, you know, when we gain an hour of sleep, we see a 21% reduction in heart attacks. So, so the data's there on, on a global level, the isn't data's, it? Just you know, from that. It's striking, you know, and you can even think, you know, you speak a lot about, um, you know, the immune system. It's so key for our health. So what do, tell us, what does sleep do for the immune system? So firstly, we can look on both sides of the coin. What happens when we don't get enough sleep? Firstly, we know that people who are sleeping five hours a night are four times more likely to catch a cold than those people who are sleeping eight hours or more. Wow. Striking study, very well controlled study. Um, we also know that it doesn't take one week of you know short sleep deprivation. One night is enough. What we've found is that if you take healthy individuals and then we limit them to just four hours of sleep for one single night, what we see is a 70% drop in critical anti-cancer fighting immune cells called natural killer cells, which are these wonderful sort of immune assassins that, you know, help decrease our, you know, sort of, you know, cancer risk. Yeah. And, and, and help us fight infections. And fight you know, infections. Part of our innate immune system. The, exactly. Yeah. Part of that critical innate immune response. Flip the, the, the sort of the side of the coin. And now what we find is that when you get sleep, 
there is a change in what we call the autonomic nervous system, which is sort of this automatic part of our nervous system. And that automatic nervous system is split into two branches. One that is sort of like the accelerator pedal that gets us revved up, triggers the fight or flight response. The other is the brake that sort of calms us down. And when we go into deep sleep, we apply that break to the nervous system and everything quiets down. Heart rate decreases. Deep sleep is the most wonderful form of natural blood pressure medication that you could ever wish for. Yeah. But one of the other things is that we see as that nervous system quiets down, levels of things like cortisol drop down, that stress-related chemical. And it's during that time that the body goes into an immune stimulation mode. And it's where essentially you're going to restock the armament of your immune army so that when you wake up the next day, you can battle and fight infection. What's also fascinating, and I love this data, and this tells you just how critical sleep is to, to a fighting uh, for our health. If you look at people who become infected or you actually infect them in the experimental laboratory, let's say with yeah. sort of a, a cold uh, vaccine, or, um, you immediately trigger increased sleepiness and increased amounts of deep sleep. And it turns out that the infection indicates to the immune system that you're under attack and the immune system will actually signal to the sleep system within the brain we need more sleep. Sleep is the best battle force that we have right now to combat this assault. And so that's why when you're sick, all you tend to want to do is just curl up in bed and go to sleep. The reason is because your body is trying to sleep you well. It's an appropriate response to what's going on, right? Exactly. It, the bodies are pretty clever, right? It, they are remarkably clever. You know, again, Mother Nature has figured this out. And so she brings up this thing called sleep, which I would argue is probably like the Swiss army knife of health. You know, whatever ailment you are facing, it is more than likely that sleep has a tool in the box to try and help fight it. That's so key. Whatever ailment you're facing, guys, if you listen to this, whatever you're suffering from, whether it's you know a lack of energy on a day-to-day -day basis, or whether it's that you're worried about your risk of developing a chronic disease such as type 2 diabetes or heart problems as you get older... You know, what Matthew is saying, what Professor Walker is saying is that sleep, improving your quality of sleep is going to help you with all these different facets. It's going to help reduce your risk, it's going to help increase your energy. It's also going to reduce your risk of actually getting disease in the future, which is just absolutely incredible. If you enjoyed that conversation, I think you are going to love the one that I had with Professor Tim Spector, all about food. It's right there. So give it a click and let me know what you think. If you snack a couple of hours before a meal, your metabolic response to that meal is poorer than if you didn't snack. Okay, just say that again, because I think that's really important.